Republic. The political clout, each commanding a tiny share of the transportation market. If their collective interests are threatened, they can unionize, go on strike, stage boycotts and create powerful voting blocks. However, once millions of human drivers are replaced by a single algorithm, all that wealth and power will be cornered by the corporation that owns the algorithm and by the handful of billionaires who own the corporation. Alternatively, the algorithms might themselves become the owners. Human law already recognizes intersubjective entities like corporations and nations as legal persons. Though Toyota or Argentina has neither a body nor mind, they are subject to international laws. They can own land and money and they can sue and be sued in court. We might soon grant similar status to algorithms. An algorithm could then own a transportation empire or a venture capital fund without having to obey the wishes of any human master. If the algorithm makes the right decisions, it could accumulate a fortune, which it could then invest as it sees fit, perhaps buying your house and becoming your landlord. If you infringe on the algorithm's legal rights, say, by not paying rent, the algorithm could hire lawyers and sue you in court. If such algorithms consistently outperform human capitalists, we might end up with an algorithmic upper class owning most of our planet. This may sound impossible, but before dismissing the idea, Remember that most of our planet is already legally owned by non-human intersubjective entities, namely nations and corporations. Indeed, 5,000 years ago much of Sumer was owned by imaginary gods such as Enki and Inanna. If gods can possess land and employ people, why not algorithms? So what will people do? Art is often said to provide us with our ultimate and uniquely human sanctuary. World where computers have replaced doctors, drivers, teachers, and even landlords, would everyone become an artist? Yet it is hard to see why artistic creation would be safe from the algorithms. Why are we so confident that computers will never be able to outdo us in the composition of music? According to the life sciences, art is not the product of some enchanted spirit or metaphysical soul, but rather of organic algorithms recognizing mathematical patterns. If so, there is no reason why non-organic algorithms couldn't master it. David Cope is a musicology professor at the University of California in Santa Cruz. He is also one of the more controversial figures in the world of classical music. Cope has written computer programs that compose concertos, chorales, symphonies and operas. His first creation was named Emmy, Experiments in Musical Intelligence, which specialized in imitating the style of Johann Sebastian Bach. It took seven years to create the program, but once the work was done Emmy composed 5,000 chorales a la Bach in a single day. Cope arranged for a performance of a few select chorales at a music festival in Santa Cruz. Enthusiastic members of the audience praised the stirring performance and explained excitedly how the music had touched their innermost being. They didn't know that it had been created by Emmy rather than Bach, and when the truth was revealed some reacted with glum silence, while others shouted in anger. Emmy continued to improve and learn to imitate Beethoven, Chopin, Rachmaninoff, and Stravinsky. Oak got Emmy a contract, and its first album, Classical Music Composed by Computer, sold surprisingly well. Publicity brought increasing hostility from classical music buffs. Professor Steve Larson from the University of Oregon sent Cope a challenge for a musical showdown. 
Larson suggested that professional pianists play three pieces one after the other, one each by Bach, by Amy, and by Larson himself. The audience would then be asked to vote on who composed which piece. Larson was convinced that people would easily distinguish between soulful human compositions and the lifeless artifact of a machine. Cope accepted the challenge. On the appointed date, hundreds of lecturers, students and music fans assembled in the University of Oregon's concert hall. At the end of the performance, a vote was taken. The result? The audience thought that Emmy's piece was genuine Bach, that Bach's piece was composed by Larson, and that Larson's piece was produced by a computer. Critics continued to argue that Emmy's music is technically excellent, but that it lacks something. It is too accurate. It has no depth. It has no soul. Yet when people heard Emmy's compositions without being informed of their provenance, they frequently praised them precisely for their soulfulness and emotional resonance. Following Emmy's successes Cope created newer and even more sophisticated programs. His crowning achievement was Annie. Whereas Emmy composed music according to predetermined rules, Annie is based on machine learning. Its musical style constantly changes and develops in response to new inputs from the outside world. Cope has no idea what Annie is going to compose next. Indeed, Annie does not restrict itself to music composition but also explores other art forms such as haiku poetry. In 2011 Cope, published Comes the Fiery Night, 2000 Haiku by Man and Machine, some of the haiku by Annie, and the rest by organic poets. The book does not disclose which are which. If you think you can tell the difference between human creativity and machine output, you are welcome to test your claim. 18 In the 19th century the Industrial Revolution created a huge urban proletariat, and socialism spread because no other creed managed to answer the unprecedented needs and fears of this new working class. Liberalism eventually defeated socialism only by adopting the best parts of the socialist program. In the 21st century we might witness the creation of a massive new unworking class. People devoid of any economic, political or even artistic value, who contribute nothing to the prosperity, power and glory of society. This useless class will not merely be unemployed. It will be unemployable. September 2013 Two Oxford researchers, Carl Benedict Frey and Michael A. Osborne, published The Future of Employment, in which they surveyed the likelihood of different professions being over by computer algorithms within the next 20 years. The algorithm developed by Frey and Osborne to do the calculations estimated that 47% of U.S. jobs are at high risk. For example, there is a 99% probability that by 2033 human telemarketers and insurance underwriters will lose their jobs to algorithms. There is a 98% probability that the same will happen to sports referees. 97% that it will happen to cashiers and 96% to chefs, waiters dash, 94% paralegal assistants, 94% tour guides, 91% bakers, 89% bus drivers, 89% construction laborers, 88% veterinary assistants, 86%, security guards, 84%, sailors, 83%, bartenders, 77%, archivists, 76%, carpenters, 72%, lifeguards, 67%, and so forth. There are of course some safe jobs, 
the hood that computer algorithms will displace archaeologists by 2033 is only 0.7% because their job requires highly sophisticated types of pattern recognition and doesn't produce huge profits. Hence it is improbable that corporations or government will make the necessary investment to automate archaeology within the next 20 years. 19. Of course, by 2033 many new professions are likely to appear, for example, virtual world but such professions will probably require much more creativity and flexibility than current run-of-the-mill jobs, and it is unclear whether 40-year-old cashiers or insurance agents will be able to reinvent themselves as virtual world designers. Try to in a virtual world created by an insurance agent, and even if they do so, the pace of progress is such that within another decade they might have to reinvent themselves yet again. After all, algorithms might well outperform. In designing virtual worlds too, the crucial problem isn't creating new jobs. The crucial problem is creating new jobs that humans perform better than algorithms. Point two zero since we do not know how the job market in 2030 or 2040. Already today we have no idea what to teach our kids. Most of what they currently learn at school will probably be irrelevant by the time they are 40. Traditionally, life has been divided into two main parts, a period of learning, followed by a period of working. Very soon this traditional model will become utterly obsolete and the only way for humans to stay in the game will be to keep learning throughout their lives and to reinvent themselves repeatedly. Many, if not most, may be unable to do so. Becoming technological bonanza will probably make it feasible to feed and support these useless masses even without any effort from their side. But what will keep them occupied? Content? People must do something, or they go crazy. What will they do all day? One answer might be drugs and computer games. Unnecessary people might spend increasing amounts of time within 3D virtual reality worlds that would provide them for more excitement and emotional engagement than the drab reality outside. Yet such a development would deal a mortal blow to the liberal belief in the sacredness of human life and of human experiences. What's so sacred about useless bums who pass their days devouring artificial experiences in La La Land? Some experts and thinkers, such as Nick Bostrom, warn that humankind is unlikely to suffer this degradation, because once artificial intelligence surpasses human intelligence, it might simply exterminate humankind. The AI would likely do so either for fear that humankind would turn against it and try to pull its plug, or in pursuit of some unfathomable goal of its own. For it would be extremely difficult for humans to control the motivation of a system smarter than themselves. Even pre-programming the system with seemingly benign goals might backfire horribly. One popular real imagines a corporation designing the first artificial superintelligence and giving it an innocent test such as calculating by. Before anyone realizes what is happening, the AI takes over the planet, eliminates the human race.